There are two black liquids that the world just can't seem to live without. One of them fuels machines, and the other fuels people. No matter how you make it, or how you take it, we just can't seem to get enough coffee. It's the world's most popular drink, and an estimated two billion cups are consumed every single day. Green coffee beans, the unroasted kind, like these, are one of the most traded agricultural commodities on the planet, fetching around $30 billion per year worldwide. And that's what we're gonna dig into in this video. The economics of coffee, how it's traded, and the forces that affect its price. So without further ado, let's get into it. Ah, that's the stuff, okay. Before we go any further, this film is just one of several explainers we've made on the economics of traded commodities, breaking down what you need to know if you're active in the market. In the past, we've covered oil and natural gas. You might wanna check those videos out, they're really interesting. But now, let's get back to this, coffee. What will it be this morning, coffee? Yes, Gracie, a cup of coffee before I start out. Coffee's global commodity price is prone to some wild ups and downs, caused mostly by supply shocks. Turns out coffee is a particularly vulnerable crop, but we'll come back to that later on. First, let's take a look at how coffee is priced and traded on the global market. To help me understand the economics of coffee, I called up Stuart Ritson. He started his coffee career 10 years ago as a barista, and now helps roasters source their beans from all over the world. I'm very spoiled in that I work with coffee every day, um, so I taste a lot of coffee. That also makes me quite jaded as well. <laughs> How about another cup, honey? You seconds on my coffee? Tastes kind of great tonight. In this film, we're talking about commodity coffee, unroasted beans traded in huge quantities on global markets. It's not the kind you usually get at your local cafe, which is considered specialty coffee. Any barista will tell you, coffee is a complex drink. There are tasting notes and flavor profiles. The levels of acidity, the quality of acidity, the sweetness, the body, the clarity of flavor. Yeah, the, you know, the je ne sais quoi. But the commodities market, it just doesn't have time for any of that. Commodities are meant to be uniform and interchangeable so that any two boxes of soybeans or barrels of Brent crude will be of more or less the same quality and command the same price. So for the most part, commodity coffee disregards those nuanced qualities. It's traded in really massive quantities on global markets. There's essentially two markets for coffee. There's the Arabica market, which is uh, based out of New York, and the Robusta market that's based out of London. Those are the two main types of coffee. Arabica is by far the most popular and the most traded, simply because it just tastes better. When you go to Starbucks or grind your own beans at home, that's most likely Arabica. It's also pickier about where it grows, preferring much higher altitudes. And then you have Robusta, which is hardier, as the name suggests, and more disease resistant, and it grows at lower altitudes. The trade-off for that is that it's a lower quality product. It has um, higher bitterness, um, it has lower sweetness. That's why Robusta is used to make instant coffee, or as a cheap filler in some coffee blends. Well, how do you like it? There's only one word for it. Terrific. Now, when it comes to the economics of coffee, perhaps the most important indicator is the C price. That's the going rate for a shipment of commodity-grade Arabica beans on the Intercontinental Exchange, or the ICE, which is where most commodity coffee is traded as futures contracts. Futures contracts commit a buyer and a seller to trade a specific amount of coffee for a predetermined price at a future date. But coffee futures aren't just for buying and selling actual physical coffee beans, though that's a big part of it. The futures market also serves three other important functions. The first is price discovery. The C price is used as a benchmark by the rest of the industry to determine a floor price or a fair price for coffee. Another important function is risk management. Futures allow traders to hedge their risk by locking in a hopefully favorable price 
ahead of potential price swings. And lastly, there's speculation. Coffee futures and options are a favorite among day traders and hedge funds who speculate on the ups and downs, hoping to turn a profit. These frequent trades also amplify the volatility. There's a lot of speculation on the market. Most trades don't end in actual delivery of real coffee beans. In fact, seven times more coffee than is actually produced is traded in Arabica futures each year. Coffee's all ready. Now let's dig into the forces that actually move coffee's price. Like anything in economics, it mostly comes back to supply and demand. But with coffee, it's mostly the supply factors that matter. Care will produce a perfect result every time. To talk about supply, you have to know how coffee is grown. So I spoke to Andres and Tomas, oh. two brothers who know coffee as well as anybody. So we've been around coffee our entire lives. Their family has been farming coffee in El Salvador for generations. It's a garden of paradise is what I like to call it. That garden of paradise takes a lot of work to tend and for uncertain payoff. And as they told me, coffee is a difficult crop to grow. Once you plant that tree, it's four years of waiting for that tree to be productive and actually produce enough coffee to be harvested. Four years. And as we'll soon find out, once those coffee trees grow coffee cherries, which contain the beans, lots of things can go wrong. As far as in, in the coffee supply chain, the coffee farmer has the highest risk with the lowest reward. This four-year growing cycle is really important for the economics of coffee, as Stuart helped me understand. Coffee is a sort of boom and bust product. Uh, this, we see these four-year cycles. That means that coffee supply is inelastic in the short run, unable to quickly respond to big shifts in demand. The price will come up at a certain point and a lot of people will plant coffee, farmers around the world. And then three or four years later, there's definitely going to be a drop in the price. Now consider the biggest bottleneck in coffee production, geography. Coffee plants grow best in tropical and subtropical climates, and Arabica especially prefers higher altitudes. It matures a little bit slower up there, but that's good because that gives it more time for it to develop uh, flavor and, and characteristics. But there's only so much high altitude land around the equator, a region known as the Bean Belt. That's why just a handful of countries produce most of the world's coffee supply, with 70% coming from the top three countries, Brazil, Vietnam, and Colombia. But Brazil by itself really tips the scales, producing around 40% of the world's coffee. When two thirds of the world wakes up in the morning, its coffee pot is filled by Sao Paulo. Its sheer size and landscape allows for large scale industrial harvesting, Brazil's market dominance means that much of the global coffee supply, and its price, depends on the agricultural fortunes of a single country. And no story makes that clearer than what happened in July of 1975. On July 17th, 1975, something strange happened in the southern Brazilian state of Paraná, something that had never happened there before. It began to snow. Temperatures plunged, resulting in Brazil's worst frost of the century. In just a couple of days, over one and a half billion coffee trees were dead, over half of the country's crop. It became known as the Black Frost, and its impacts on the coffee market were felt for years afterwards. Because the dead trees would take years to replace, the frost sent a chill throughout the global market, and the price of coffee futures skyrocketed. Since then, frosts have contributed to several price spikes, including just last year. There was frost in certain large growing areas of Brazil and the price of coffee went up and it's still like almost twice what it was last year. But frost isn't the only problem. Drought can ruin crops and send prices soaring, which has happened in Brazil several times over the past few decades. And it doesn't stop there. Unseasonal and irregular rains can also have a dramatic impact on a coffee yield, which tends to rely on a regular cycle between wet and dry seasons. 
They used to be like clockwork. Rainy season would stop in October. That's not so much the case anymore. Diseases and pests are an issue as well. For example, coffee leaf rust, a fungus which covers the plant's leaves with brown spots. And this disease has devastated crop yields in Central America over the decades. Here's something really interesting. It turns out that Arabica coffee trees may be particularly prone to disease owing to their lack of genetic diversity because they share a recent common ancestor. All of the coffee trees can be traced back to one single tree that was brought to the Caribbean a few hundred years ago. And that, that doesn't create a lot of genetic uh, variance and genetic variance creates resistance to problems and diseases. So it's actually quite a vulnerable product. Vulnerable indeed. And climate change is just worsening all of these problems. It's, it's getting tougher and tougher because regardless of what you believe, it is getting warmer. We see that at the farm and it is inviting different pests, different types of diseases into this environment that wasn't there when our grandparents were doing this. All of this raises concerns that coffee will become even harder to grow in the future, impacting its price. The outlook for coffee, especially Arabica, is, isn't great when it comes to climate change. People do predict that a lot of coffee producing areas in the world will possibly even disappear in the coming 20, 30 years time. Especially as hotter temperatures push coffee production up to higher and higher altitudes, restricting suitable cropland and making it much harder to farm. So where does this leave us? What does all of this mean for the future of coffee and for its price? Well, coffee consumption is generally on the rise and in some surprising places. Just look at China, where tea has long been the drink of choice and coffee consumption is relatively low. But that may be changing. It's now one of the world's fastest growing coffee markets with domestic consumption growing upwards of 10% per year. As for the future of the coffee supply, Climate change will play a big role, making it harder and harder to grow enough Arabica to satisfy demand. But botanists are experimenting with more adaptable coffee variants. They're looking for varieties that thrive and do well in those difficult situations. And there are some promising varieties like Liberica that might mix the robustness of Robusta and the taste of Arabica. Now, what does all this mean for the future of coffee prices? Well, climate change brings uncertainty, and uncertainty tends to make for unstable prices. For sure, there's gonna be some difficult years in the coming 10, 20 years, 30 years time, when there's really bad droughts and really bad frosts, and it could really push volatility in the market to new levels. Thanks so much for watching. This has been an interesting film for me to produce. I learned a lot about the drink that I enjoy every morning, and I hope you did too. If you liked it, show your love by hitting like and subscribe. And make sure you check out our othercapital.com explainers as well about commodities like oil and natural gas. You might find those interesting. Stay tuned for more films like this in the future, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.